All right, good evening, everybody. This is the Dr. Nurse here, and I have received a request to do a short presentation on um, CAD versus PAD and kind of discuss peripheral arterial disease versus um, peripheral venous insufficiency. So let's go ahead and get into it. So what is CAD? Well, by definition, CAD or coronary artery disease is simply a progressive narrowing of the coronary arteries caused by atherosclerosis. Um, for it to be considered CAD, the arteries have to be at least 70% occluded. And I have misspelled narrowing there. Oh my gosh. Narrow king of the coronary arteries. All right, so now we know what it is. Talk about the patho. So everybody knows that a good patho statement starts out with your risk factors slash etiologies, correct? So what are our risk factors for CAD? What things that we are just born with or that we do to ourselves contribute to those abnormal cellular changes in the body that eventually lead to the development of CAD? Well, smoking. Um, smoking over and over causes repeated inflammation, which damages the lining of those vessels. Hypertension, diabetes, those things both damage the vessels. Gender, men are a little bit higher risk for CAD. Um, high cholesterol, obviously, because um, the formation of uh, the plaques is highly dependent on LDL. So you'll see that called high cholesterol or hyperlipidemia or dyslipidemia. It's all the same thing. And, of course, a strong family history of CAD. All right, so whatever it is, it may be one of those factors. It may be a combination of all those factors. But those factors contribute to injury to those endothelial cells within the lining of the coronary arteries. And that sets off an inflammatory response. Now, when the inflammatory response is set off abnormally, it's not a good thing. All right, inflammation is supposed to heal and repair when, uh, when we're exposed to something um, that, you know, that we shouldn't be. But <clears throat> these things, um, these etiologies, these risk factors are setting off the inflammatory cascade abnormally. When that happens, cytokines are released and those start attracting those macrophages that stick to that site and they start releasing LDL or low density lipoprotein. That's the bad cholesterol, right? It's bad. We want it low because it's sticky and it attracts stuff to it leading to eventually these formation of these fatty streaks within the, uh, the inner lining of the vessels. And then eventually those fatty streaks become fibrotic plaques when stuff just keeps building up and building up and building up on top of that fatty streak. So when is it really bad when, uh, when our patient has CAD? Well, when that plaque ruptures, that uh, sets off the coagulation cascade. Then we've got thrombin being produced. We've got fibrinogen being converted to fibrin. We've got platelets that are attracted to the site. Okay, now what we've got here is we've got ourselves a thrombus in a coronary artery, and that is never a good thing. So this process right here that we just talked about, this abnormal rupture of the plaque that is there because of the process of atherosclerosis, this is why these patients are on which medications? They're going to be on antiplatelets, right? If they're not taking the aspirin for a fever or pain, they're taking aspirin, they're taking Plavix to prevent that platelet aggregation, okay? Um, and then if the thrombus breaks off, you know, and, and travels, it can actually lead to complete occlusion or, you know, almost complete occlusion of a coronary artery. And then we've got ourselves an injury or an infarction. Okay, but then we're moving on into um, what we would call acute coronary syndrome or a myocardial infarction. Okay, both of those um, fall under the, the heading of CO, CAD, but CAD is kind of like, um, you know, COPD. Um, it's more of an umbrella term. All right, so how do we treat CAD? Well, what kind of diet are we going to teach these folks? I'm going to go with low sodium, low fat, low cholesterol, low taste, low everything, right? 
Um, Cause CAD, you know, with just CAD, we haven't actually had an MI yet necessarily. Okay. Um, so this is more, we're more aiming our interventions, our care at prevention, at preventative measures. So these folks don't have an MI, all right? We're going to recommend exercise at least 30 minutes, three times a week. Weight loss if the person is obese. Stop that smoking. And obviously they need to manage their hypertension and diabetes because those are all, we're just, see, a, see the trend here? We're aiming our treatment, our interventions at those etiologies, at those contributing factors to CAD. All right, so medications to control cholesterol. We got statins, and you see I've got asterisks because those are by far the most widely used. <clears throat> statins um, do have, you know, kind of a deleterious effect on the liver. They're not just real good for the liver, but they are the most widely used. The bile acid resins, that's going to make the patient poop out the cholesterol. Um, the thing with bile acid resins is they don't need to be taken um, with food or like anywhere around time to eat or if you've just eaten or whatever because those bile acid resins are um, they're going to prevent absorption of what you eat or if you take another medicine oh don't no, no don't ever make sure you always tell your patient this the the bile acid resins you cannot take another medication um, you know, within an hour before or like four hours after you take the bile acid resin because it is going to interfere with the absorption of that medication. Um, Zetia is another, it's kind of one of the newer ones. And then niacin. Niacin is nicotinic acid. Um, it's a B vitamin. You know, the patient is going to experience like some facial flushing and warmth because it's a, it's a vasodilator, um, but that's normal. It's totally normal. Got a friend that has to take niacin um, for her cholesterol. Um, I don't want her to not be my friend anymore, so I won't mention her name, but I could walk into her office and I'd be like, you just took your niacin because her face is just red. I mean, beet red, like she's just ready to murder somebody. But that's just what it is. It's that facial flushing um, after after the niacin from the base. And then also they're going to be taking um, aspirin, that's ASA, okay, so that's your antiplatelets. And then some others, um, Plavix, maybe Effiant, Berlinta, those are all um, antiplatelet medications. Okay, so all preventative care, you know, when I want to ask in clinical, you know, why are they on the aspirin? MITIA prophylaxis, right? If they got to CAD, they're going to be on the aspirin. All right, so let's look at peripheral arterial disease. Does this patho look anything like the patho that we just saw for CAD? Well, there's a good reason for that. It should. It's the same process um, that's eventually leading to reduced or absent arterial blood flow, but to the extremities, whereas CAD is caused by atherosclerosis and you are narrowing the lumen of a coronary artery with PAD, all these processes are leading to narrowing of peripheral arteries, okay? So the arteries that feed our lower legs and our feet. Same process, okay? Same process. All right. Essentially, you know, the patho are, are the same. We've just got the only difference is coronary versus peripheral. Which is more deadly? <laughs> coronary. If I got to choose, if I would rather have CAD or PAD, I would rather have PAD, wouldn't you? All right, so let's look at the two classifications of PAD. So lower limb ischemia or PAD can be classified as either functional or critical, and that's going to be the difference between the signs and symptoms that your patient complains of. All right, with functional PAD, basically this patient has good blood flow at rest, but when they start walking or exercising and, you know, vessels start vasoconstricting, because that's what happens when, when we exercise, then they experience pain. And that's what we call intermittent claudication, okay? Classic, classic, classic symptom of peripheral arterial disease. Remember that term. That is reduced blood flow to the extremities with 
exercise with walking. Okay, this is classified as stage two of the disease. Now, when we get over into the critical part, these patients are going to be complaining of pain at rest, like they're just sitting on a couch and their legs and their feet are hurting. And then finally, with the last stage of the disease, you're going to start seeing some nasty skin changes, what we call trophic skin changes, some possibly some ulcers, um, dry skin, no hair growth, scaling, um, dry, thin, scaly nails. Okay, just think of, you know, if your your left foot, you know, went without adequate blood flow for a long period of time, that foot is not going to be looking good. You're not going to be growing hair on it. Your nails are going to be all dead and dying off and scaling off. Your skin's going to be dying off, flaking off, dry, scaly. Okay, so just think about that kind of thing in your mind when you're trying to um, decipher which signs and symptoms go with disease process. All right, so I know a lot of students get confused with um, these two disorders, which they should not be confusing at all, y'all, because, you know, and you'll hear me say this, the patho, the patho, the patho. You've got peripheral arterial insufficiency versus venous insufficiency. One is a blood flow issue, okay? One is a blood return issue, all right? With peripheral arterial insufficiency, we're not getting adequate blood flow, all right? So in addition to the things that I just discussed, those classic signs and symptoms that I just discussed, a patient with PAD is also going to complain of paresthesias, numbness, tingling, neuropathic pain. It's going to be, the extremity is going to be cool, pale, um, a reduced pulse. You know, these are the folks that we're having to get that Doppler out because we can't find their pedal pulse. All right. So it's a blood flow issue. They're not getting blood flow adequate to, to their extremities. So they're experiencing these signs and symptoms that fall just right in line with a blood flow issue. Now, what if these people develop an ulcer? How is it going to look different than that of an ulcer of peripheral venous insufficiency? Well, we call these ulcers, they have a punched out appearance, okay? A punched out appearance. They're more clean looking. I just kind of try to think of it like is a blood flow issue. So I've got reduced blood flow in this one area. So it's like it's punched out, okay, and it's going to be on the outside of the ankle, okay, on the outside of the ankle. The blood um, is going to feed the insides of your feet first because you just have more, um, you have more blood flow on the inside. So an arterial ulcer is going to be punched out on the outside of the ankle. It's going to be more clean looking. There's not going to be swelling. Um, Low hair growth, cool to touch, pallor, it's a blood flow issue. So on the other side, with venous insufficiency, it's a blood return issue. Blood is getting down there, but it can't get back up, okay? So we're going to have swelling. Just think about all the blood, it's pooling down there, right? Our veins are insufficient. Um, the most common cause of venous insufficiency is going to be uh, varicose veins, Okay, varicose veins, incompetent valves, whatever it is, it's a blood return issue. So you will have edema. Um, these people will complain of pain, but remember it's a blood return issue. So if you raise the leg up, which is going to help that venous return, the pain is going to improve. Okay, the venous, it's a blood return. Raise that leg up. Arterial, it's a blood flow keep the leg down. Now, how does the ulcer look with PVD? I used to get so com confused about by this, or really I should not say PVD because PVD is a blanket term for arterial and venous. But our ulcer of venous insufficiency is just going to look nasty. I just picture a leg of someone with varicose veins, and I just picture the way that those varicose veins look and they're swollen, their ankles are swollen. The, the ulcer is not clean at all. It's just, there's sometimes some brown or black discoloration of the skin and there's gonna be drainage. 
and these ulcers are actually going to be on the inside okay so if you remember that your arterial ulcer is a punched out on the outside of the ankle then just remember your venous ulcer is going to be the exact opposite it's going to be on the inside or the medial malleolus of the ankle it's going to look more messy there's going to be edema there's going to be discoloration there's going to be drainage it's a blood return issue all right so how do we take care of these patients well like i said with pad or peripheral arterial disease it's a blood flow issue keep that leg below the level of the heart we've got to keep that extremity perfused if you raise that leg up that leg's going to turn pale as a sheet and you're going to be stopping what little blood flow that was getting to that foot keep the extremities warm this means you can wrap them in socks or gloves but don't ever put no heating pad or anything like that on the extremity of somebody with pad because they can't feel the heat to tell you that it's hurting okay they may have peripheral neuropathy or whatever because the their pad is so advanced so don't ever put no heat directly on the extremity of someone with pad um, these folks are to be taking meds um, platol and trental um, platol is actually a uh, it um how can i say this it works on red blood cells actually to improve their flexibility if you will and so uh it reduces blood viscosity um it also is a platelet um it prevents platelet aggregation so all those things work to um, increase blood flow to the extremities uh trental is a vasodilator you know, so you want to watch um, taking any vasodilator with any other vasodilators like nitro or uh, Viagra. Um, but these are these are medications that are strictly to relieve the pain of um, intermittent claudication that goes along with arterial insufficiency. So with venous insufficiency, you know, most of these folks, um, another thing, arterial people are, are mainly men venus are mainly women with uh with varicose veins so how do we treat these um well if they don't already have you know ulcers or anything like that we're going to encourage ted's kindles um tell them you know if they have to work a job where they're on their feet a long time you know like us as nurses um to wear those hose get when they get home raise those legs up raise those legs up it's a blood return issue so raise the legs up and avoid sitting standing too long um you know crossing your legs all that contributes to the development of varicose veins which is no good for venous insufficiency i hope you all have found this helpful i can't believe i hit that in under 20 minutes um, but anyway, visit me at thedoctornurse.com, subscribe to my YouTube channel, Dr. Nurse, and be sure to follow me on Instagram. And I thank you guys for listening and hope you have a great night.